Hello, Bodwin. Great to see you. Thank you very much indeed for coming on to Evolution Soup from your home in Washington, D.C. You're a Paleolithic archaeologist and a contractor at the Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History, specifically the Human Origins Program, where you work to engage and teach the public on evolution and archaeology. But I believe you have a couple of links uh, to England, don't you? <laughs> I do, actually. Yeah, my, my mom is from um, Hereford. So um, the kind of oh. entire half of my family is, well, all the living parts of my family are all in England. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm kind of waiting for the day for my the rest of my parents to move back over there. So, yeah, so I've been coming to England like every other year since I was about, since I was born. Mm -hmm. I know you've, uh, you've been to the museums here as well. You like the British Museum, don't you? Well, uh, yes, I, I think as a child, I I adored the British Museum. Mm -hmm. And the Natural History Museum as well, especially the human evolution section. I, mm -hmm. I go there all the time. Uh, I absolutely love it. Yeah, I love, a, a good museum, I think, is such a wonderful entry point into science for, for most people. So, We're going to be talking about several really intriguing topics all yeah. within the world of paleoanthropology. But before we dive into that, can you just give us a little bit more insight into your early years and what made you want to get involved yeah. in this field? It's a great question. I think growing up going back to england um was really informative for making me really interested in the past in a very more kind of tangible way i think minnesota obviously does have um a lot of archaeological heritage but it's not as kind of up close and in your face as it is in like some you know southern parts of the u.s or like the southwest of the u.s where it's a lot more kind of visible um, we have, you know, a couple of archaeological sites. We have a wonderful, you know, Minnesota Historical Society. But it's not like you can walk out of your house and there is a castle, right? Mm -hmm. Which was very different for, you know, when you walk around Hereford Town Square, there's the, the old black and white house that you can go in and kind of see the past right there in the town square, um, you know, or the church that's however many hundreds of years old. And so, or the cathedral, right? And I think as a child, I was really enamored with, obviously, you know, like most kids are, like stories about King Arthur and knights and learning. About, like, so it, it became kind of intertwining the past with those stories made me really interested in actively pursuing more of kind of those structures and seeing those structures. So as a kid, I always wanted to go see the castle or go see the museum because they were so intertwined with those stories. Um, that I was learning and was kind of eating up as a kid. So I think that was definitely part of it. Um, and also kind of as I got older too, it's this idea of I don't, I'm not scared of death at all. I know this, this got really deep really fast, but I'm not scared of death necessarily, but it's the idea of being forgotten and mm. the voices of those who were in the past mm. who built the world that we have today and those voices getting lost. And I was never fully comfortable with that idea more than the idea of, I think, death in general. And so that really made me want to, okay, I want to know more about these ordinary individuals, these people who, you know, we don't have written records of what they said, but we have these objects that are in the ground that are evidence of, of how they lived their everyday lives. And I think that mm. that is so important to know. Um, even if it is for my own selfish reasons of kind of being afraid of being forgotten myself. But I think that was, that was kind of where it all started um, for me as a kid. Um, more paleoanthropology and, and evolution was when I was, I think I was 12 or I, I turned 12 or I was 11. Um, I won a competition with National Geographic Kids. It was a competition where I think it was like about 15 of us from around the US uh, won. And we had to to apply, it was write a story about a place in like, your community that you actively explore and you take a photo of that place. And it was like an essay competition. The kids that won then got to go to the Galapagos with one of our parents. Uh, and we stayed on a Lindblad expedition boat and we had National Geographic photographers with us. Uh, and we kind of 
learned about biodiversity and evolution and the islands themselves. And, and that was kind of the first time I really started to engage with Darwin and evolution and, and seeing kind of these, the things that inspired him to start thinking about the theory of evolution. And so that, that's where it all started for him on the Galapagos. Yeah, I think that was where like the evolution bit got tied in with this kind of underlying already being really interested in the past um, yeah. and, and loving to dig around in the dirt. And then this kind of aspect came in that then really in college, I took my first, you know, human origins class and just fell in love, just head over heels. <laughs> wow. Yeah. How, how did we evolve? What does it mean to be human? How can we look at these questions? when we have nothing, you know, we don't have writing, we only have kind of tiny fragments. And how can we look at that and build the story of our collective human past? Pretty much. Yeah, and stone tools, which I know is a passion of yours, but yes. we'll get to that later. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> you appeared recently on the A Life in Ruins archaeology podcast, yeah. talking about your work in the Kubi-4 region of Kenya, home to a whole host of hominid discoveries, uh, Homo ergaster, Homo habilis, and uh, Paranthropus boisei, and of course, lots of stone tools. So um, Ella, can you tell us a bit about your time in Kubi-4 and the work you were doing there? I went for the first time to Kubi-4 as part of the Kubi-4 Field School, um, which is an organiz it's a program kind of run through GW now, or George Washington University here in Washington, DC. And it is a way for um, you to kind of get out into the field, see what it's like to do field work, and and, it's an amazing program. So if you are in, if you're in college to be an archaeologist, you kind of have to do a field school. It's kind of as part of often your major to graduate. Uh, and that's really just so that you know that you have and can do the practical skills of digging something up and recording it well enough. Um, so I applied, got into the field school. It is basically what we do is we train undergraduates, grad students to do paleoanthropology, you know, how to use the drone, how to do proper excavation, how to, you know, really get into the data itself. Like, how do we use data um, to answer these big questions? And so what's kind of interesting and different about the Kubi-4 Field School itself is that you're paired with a mentor who then has like a project that they're very interested in. And then you kind of have your own project to collect real data on, you know, and really learn about. It's not just go dig a hole for me, you know, you're really starting to understand, okay, what does it mean to actually do science in this field? Did um, you have to come up with this project beforehand or did you develop it in the yeah. field or? So the, the instructor kind of has the project, right? Like, cause it's part, it's often part of their own research, but you get to work with the instructor to understand, okay, what is it to tweak it to kind of like, approach it in whatever way you can but it is it's really structured right because it's for people who've not necessarily ever done field work before so while you don't fully you don't get to you get to pick your project though right like you get to kind of pick which aspect you're most interested in and so that was the first time i went out there and i loved it fell in love fell in love with the air the dirt everything um and kind of continued to come back first as an intern uh, and then as a staff member myself with my own project. Um, and I'm actually heading back out to the field in a week. So oh, wow. yeah, yeah. So heading back to Kenya in a week um, to be with the Kubi4 Field School again. Will you be able to follow that on Instagram? I'm going to try and post as many updates as I can. Kubi4 is very difficult, right? It's probably the hardest. And I, I've done field work all over. And it's probably one of the hardest field sites I've ever been to just because of it's very remote. We don't have satellite. We don't, you know, you know, we don't have internet. We don't have power. You know, we have a generator that does most of our power. We have to go really far to get water. We have solar panels, right? We have, so it, it it's kind of a huge, huge effort to get up and out there. Um, so I'm not going to have access to a ton of stuff while I'm actually in the field, but when we're coming back down into Nairobi, uh, I should. And, yeah, so it's it's really fun, but it's it's hard work. It's it's not, which is great. You know, it's one of those places where people go and they're a part of the field school, and they either realize, "Wow, I really love this," or it's too hot. <laughs> yeah, it's too hot, and I don't like this. You know, which is 
a completely valid like of course <laughs> completely be like ooh hmm no thanks <laughs> like this is not you, right when you're looking in someone else's instagram think oh, i want to do that you're not feeling the heat and getting the dust up your nose are you no you're not feeling the heat you're not getting the dust up your nose you know it's not like we have any fresh vegetables for the entire time we're out there um you know by the end of it i can eat like a whole onion raw just for the the taste <laughs> like just for mm. that freshness um yeah, that I'm not, I'm, I'm not selling it. It's worth it. It's amazing. Um, but it is difficult. You know, it's one of those things where it's not for the faint of heart. But it's a good difficult, isn't it? Yes. Yeah, it, it, I like to say it's my, um, my one workout of the year. So <laughs> I don't have to work out at all. And then I go into the field and I get strong and can pick up things. And I'm good for the rest of the year until I go back out again. <laughs> Uh, and I've asked you this before. I mean, I know that you're into stone tools more than uh, the hominids and all that, but uh, you do have a favorite hominid, don't you? Which I mentioned just early, earlier. Yes, I do. Um, Pranthus boisei is, I think, my favorite hominid. And and not for any scientific reason, really, uh, mostly because of the reconstructions of it. I just think he looks like the sweetest, gentlest little babe, and I love it. So uh, I, I work at um, the Human Origins Program at the Smithsonian's Natural uh, History Museum, and we have reconstructions in the hall. So we have kind of a bust with the hair and kind of more facial, like from kind of here on up reconstruction. And then we have another reconstruction in bronze, which I love because it's in, an, it's in a movement that probably this individual would have done. So they obviously, so Parenthus boisei was most probably vegetarian or primarily subsisted off of plant matter, tubers, grasses, et cetera, et cetera. We know that because of the size of their, their molars, right? They have enormous molars that have often also, I think they have like a lot of analysis has been done on the striations and the wear patterns that come from eating grasses. And isn't um, it right that the, the crest along the, the sagittal crest, as they call yes. it, that ridge at the top of their skull seems to have something to do with that, the muscles, is that right? Exactly. Yeah, no, exactly. So when I think the more, more easy image that we kind of are aware of, right, is like a lion skull, right? You can kind of picture a lion skull where it's like it's kind of oblong and it has this huge crest on, on the front. And so the crest is where basically all of the muscles attach from the jaw. So what that shows us, the heat, the kind of the, the height of the sagittal crest on Parenthus boisei, what that shows us is they had incredibly strong jaws because that's from that, the, those muscles pulling on that piece of bone, right? Um, creating kind of that ridge. It's not like they were born without a ridge, but it, it, it helps with all those tons of muscles attaching. And we don't need it because we don't have that strong jaw, right? If we had really, really strong jaws, we would need that attachment. And so we know that they were, they had really strong and they also had, um, kind of the zygomatic arch, I think is, or what? Well, the face, they, they look like they had very wide cheekbones, the, uh, yeah, that particular exactly. robust. So those cheekbones, right, is because the muscles for the jaw are attaching underneath them. So it's all these indications that they had a lot of jaw muscle, but the reconstruction is it pulling a tuber out of the ground, um, is the kind of full bronze reconstruction we have. Yeah. And it's wonderful because every time you walk in there there's like six kids climbing all over it and uh, or looking at the face you know like really getting face to face with with the reconstruction and it's awesome ella being female in this field has always had its problems and setbacks but you are also dyslexic you obviously you've done very well so far so uh, what would you say to any young girls who are interested in paleoanthropology archaeology uh, or similar sciences that would encourage them, and also to anyone in general who wants to get into the sciences and who is dyslexic? So for me, you know, I'm very dyslexic and I have dyscalculia. So that means that I really can't um, do any sort of calculation inside of my head. It just, just not gonna happen. Truly cannot read a clock. I find it very difficult. You know, like numbers uh, just don't go in my brain in a way because of the way my brain is wired. And so I've found a lot of workarounds. But that being said, when I was little, there was a lot of people who told me, you know, you might not graduate college, you might not go to college, and you're never gonna be a scientist, right? My parents always were like, you can be whatever you want, but you know, you kind of get these messages instilled by other people, right? 
And I like to view it as science a lot like if you were learning to ride a bike. So every per you know, you're not born able to ride a bike. You have to learn. And I think that often the science is, is very similar as like, okay, I got on this bike. I'm trying to learn how to ride a bike. I'm not very good yet. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm wobbling all over the place. I've fallen over. And then if someone came over to me after I fell off my bike and they said, oof, you're not that good at riding a bike. I'm really sorry, but you should, it seems to me like you're a walking person. Like, I just don't think you can ride a bike. I think you have to walk from now on, right? And the reason I say that is because I think science is very similar, that you don't, you know, the more you practice, the more you learn, the more tools that you build, the better you get. No one, I think there obviously are pro tiny baby prodigies that, you know, are amazing at math and science, but that doesn't give you the tools to be a good scientist, you know? It's the practice and the care. And if you're riding a bike and you fall off a bunch, you're not going to say, oh, I'm a walking person just because you fell off a bunch. You're going to keep practicing and then you're going to get good. Yeah. And I think that too often we yeah, have this idea that if you're not good at it, you know, within your first years of high school, oh, then you can never do it, you know? And, and, mm. and I think that's told too often, you know, I, I loved it. And thankfully I had someone who helped me put training wheels on my bike. <laughs> There's also that expectation, right? That like, I should know everything off the top of my head. There are books for a reason, right? I've been trained to look in certain books for an answer. So if I can't come up with something off the top of my head, I can find it. But, you know, there's these assumptions that you have to be, you have to be a certain type of way to be a scientist. And that's not true. And also, one of the amazing things about being a scientist today is it's an incredibly collaborative field. You know, yeah. gone are the days where it's one dude in a lab discovering, right? You know, I'm not good at math. Know who's amazing at math? My co-author. Know what I'm good at? The theory. You know, like that's that's where it gets kind of science today is this incredibly amazing collaborative experience that if you are not good at one thing, that does not mean that you have to be barred from all of STEM. Um, and for those who don't realize what STEM is, it's an oh, acronym, yeah. right? Yes. So science, technology, engineering, math. mathematics. Yeah. Mathematics. Yeah. STEM for sure. STEM for sure. There's where my dyslexia comes in. I'm like, oh, I don't. Acronyms are hard. Um, but yeah, I think I just really hope like the wonderful thing also about the internet today is there are so many amazing uh, role models that you can reach out to. And, and that's kind of what I would say to all of the, you know, any little girl that watches this, like there are, you know, type in, this is what a, this is what a scientist looks like the hashtag, and there are so many women out there. You know, they're women of, uh, you know, gender, orientation, race, everything that are out there where you can find someone now who looks like you. Obviously, we need to have more of the money and resources behind those voices, but they're out there, um, which is being also really helpful for me, right? I'm, a, I'm very young in my field, and I have these amazing people that I look up to that look like me in science that I can ask to be my mentors and who have been. And that's been an incredible experience. You know, even using Twitter to like reach out to different sciences, scientists have been really awesome. And kind of finally too, with like the learning disability as well, there are the amount of times I, yeah, that you're told you're like, you're not dumb. You're just learning. And there are amazing resources out there for kids with learning disabilities or any sort of other thing to help you get around stuff. I know for me, uh, reading is still really difficult. And I, you know, part of dyslexia, right, too, is that at least for at least for me, is that when you're reading, you often get really like just exhausted. It's like it feels like you run a marathon um, reading, you know, one or two pages physically, um, just because you're you know you're trying really hard. To concentrate and for me what I've found is taking things in audio like or, or through audio is how I read so I still have all of you know every textbook I have on my laptop that I have read to me uh, and there's no shame in in asking and seeking out the things that you need to succeed right they're just tools to help you do well and I think that too often we're expected that we're supposed to just 
know how to do it or learn how to do it or be on our own. But that's not what science is. You need tools and you need collaboration. Right, Ella, I think that's really great. Thank you so much for giving us this brief look into the fascinating world of paleoanthropology and archaeology. It's definitely uh, some of my favorite subjects, and you're working really hard to make it interesting and engaging. So thank you for that. I will put links to all your social media in the description below. And if there's anyone who wants to contact you regarding paleoanthropology, archaeology, and the sciences in general, is it okay for them to, to do that? Hell yeah, you're welcome to DM me or on Twitter or Instagram. I yeah, check them regularly. Excellent. I will put those in the uh, description below, like I said. So, Ella Bodwin, thank you very much indeed. And uh, hopefully, we will catch up with you again for another chat. <laughs>